Um, hi. Um, I'd like to talk today about uh, Secure Unified Kernel Images for generic Linux distributions and everyone else. Um, this is uh, supposed to address something that uh, for a longer time I think was uh, pretty, solved pretty terribly on uh, generic Linux distributions. And I think we should do something about this. So uh, yeah, this is uh, going to highlight some ideas. And most of these ideas are actually already, oh, am I, can I take this off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, most of these ideas are uh, also uh, already implemented, so they're not just ideas. Um, but uh, 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 they, you, you still have to put all the building blocks together to actually get the result. And uh, this is where uh, there's still a lot of uh, uh, space to discuss. So um, before I start uh, with all the stuff that I actually want to talk about, let's uh, talk about uh, what the status quo right now is. So uh, the kernel image um, right now is uh, typically on the big distributions, regardless if you use uh, Fedora, RHEL, Ubuntu, SUSE, it doesn't matter. It's pretty much always the same. The kernel image is self-assigned. Um, it's built by the OS vendor and signed by the OS vendor. The initial RAM disk, however, um, is not signed nor encrypted and usually generated locally. Right? Like uh, you install the kernel RPM and it has the effect of locally calling an initRD generator and it generates an initRD and drops it into slash boot. And uh, yeah, that happens every time you update your kernel. It happens every time you have to change some basic configuration that affects uh, the initRD um, and so on. Um, these initRD generators are basically every distribution has their own. Um, uh, Azusa has one, or I think they even actually switch to the one that uh, Red Hat has. But traditionally, I mean, there are as many initRD generators as their distributions. These initRD generators are usually shell scripts that try to magically figure out what actually needs to be in the initRD image and what doesn't. Um, and the way they do this is mostly by parsing the output of LDD, right? They like look at the ELF binaries, look at the LDD output of it, and then figure out, OK, I need this library and this library. It's all a little bit black magic because um, this information is relatively incomplete. Um, uh, 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 like it cannot cover things like loadable modules, like for example, lib NSS stuff um, and things like that. So uh, yeah, the, it's basically in a way it builds its own weaker form of packaging um, with dependencies and all those things on in individual file level, um, even though most of the distributions have a package manager anyway. Um, I know these generally mix code and configuration. I mean, there's some certain beginnings of uh, separating this because you have the kernel command line where you're supposed to put all the configuration and then inside of the NRD you're not. But in reality, because uh, uh, NRDs uh, all end up with complex stuff, with certificates, with uh, things like that, um, uh, yeah, the NRDs actually tend to also contain configuration a lot. So it's all this fuzzy ball of everything that might be needed. Um, yeah, parameterization, I already indicated that this happens by kernel command line. And yeah, well, by including configuration files at the initRD image. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I mean, there, there are other ways how to do this, and there are certain systems that do it other way. But this is like, I'm, I'm trying to um, focus here on the big picture how generic distributions do it. And I would like to propose how to change that. So the problems I see with this is. Yeah, there's no integrity checking whatsoever, right? Like uh, we have all this infrastructure for secure boot, but it only protects the kernel itself, not the NRD. It's the NRD is not protected in any way. It's trivial, trivial to backdoor the boot process of a generic Linux system because yeah, the CPIOs has no protection, nothing. Every script kitty can do this with the least amount of effort. Insert any kind of binary that gets started um, before um, fullest encryption is set up and can ask the the secrets um, that it needs for full disk encryption from you um, and you will have no way to figure that out. Now, there's no confidentialities in NRD images, right? You want these two um, usually um, if you want uh, yeah, to have secrets, uh, credentials for network boot and so on. Like you, you want to boot from iSCSI and you need an iSCSI password for the things like this. Um, yeah, it mixes everything. So uh, yeah. It's not very clean in any way. It's fragile because the way it's built, right? Like it's on the individual system. So it will vary widely between systems. Um, and it's, it's, it's fragile because it parses LDD. It's a giant shell script that you know, might hopefully run, but also might be not run the way you expect. Um, uh, we nowadays want measured boot, right? TPM measurements. Um, but uh, that, that's all great if you can. Uh, 
measure in RD, but what's even greater is if you can actually uh, pre-calculate what the PCR measurements will result in. Because uh, why do you actually do the TPM measurements? Is because you want to be able to bind disk encryption to it or other form of uh, security constructs to it. But if you cannot um, pre-calculate um, uh, what the hash values um, will be, um, like the PCR values uh, will be uh, once you install this kernel in this inner ID or something, it's very hard to bind stuff to it because it basically means, uh, yeah, you have to boot up, look at the values, then you can bind your stuff to these values, um, and then you have a problem when the kernel is updated or the inner ID updated because that means, yeah, you have to now recalculate the hashes and then update every single object you bound to it. And that's a mess, of course. So, uh, yeah, you want pre calculated um, PCR values. Um, yeah, it's untestable due to combinatorial explosion, right? Like, um, as we professionalize how Linux development works, we usually nowadays have large CI systems that try to really test as much as we can of all the components that we have. But this is almost impossible to do properly for InitRD because there's so many options, and then you stick the, the, the configuration in it, and yeah. Um, yeah, and then, of course, also means that uh, changing low-level OS configuration always requires to do a rebuild, right? Like, it's basically as if you're rebuilding your whole operating system every time you just make a tiny configuration to where you want to boot from. Um, it also has its good things, right? Like, for example, uh, uh, it's extremely flexible and hackable. I mean, hackable can be a good thing, uh, too. It's not just a bad thing if uh, somebody can exploit your system. It's also a good thing because it's very easy. You just throw another file and rerun the generator, and there you go. Um, it's uh, it's typically more minimal than the, than the usual package manager um, approaches, right? Like if you build the init ID from RPM, it's going to be larger. But yeah, um, and it's already implemented, tested, and deployed. So uh, yeah, just so uh, I wanted, I just put this slide here basically so that people don't complain that it didn't have any goods, but it has goods. So um, with the stuff that I actually want to talk about. Um, these are the goals that I want to cover, right? I want to be able to pre-build inner RDs um, that can be signed by the vendor, right? Like so that if Fedora wants to to uh, ship uh, um, their distribution, they will ship it with one inner RD that is pre-built on Koji, on the build system of uh, Fedora, and similar for the other distributions. Um, I want uh, secure parameterization of kernels and inner RDs, right? That we um, have a high, uh, like, like that we can guarantee both integrity and confidentiality of the parameters we pass to it. This is, uh, I think, this is a necessity because, uh, yeah, we nowadays live in a world where you want to ship TLS certificates and pff, iSCSI passwords and whatnot. So we should have some strategy there that even though we pre-build everything and make it immutable, we also still can pass parameters to it um, that are better protected than they are right now. Um, what I also care a lot about is a stable deterministic TPM measurements that can be pre-calculated. I already explained that earlier. Um, why that's a good thing. Um, yeah. I want still some degree of modularity, right? Like, because if we pre-build them on by the by the distribution, this, of course, um, if you do it naively, basically means everybody runs the same inner RD. And that basically means everybody has to make the same choices on, I don't know, a storage uh, uh, systems, like everybody has to use LVM because that's what we built at the inner ID or something and so on. This is, of course, not going to fly, right? Like for a gen general purpose distribution, like Fedora, for example, is, um, yeah, you probably want some modularity because uh, people do crazy stuff in the, um, uh, with uh, how they boot the system. So, uh, yeah, having a single um, inner ID and that's, that all would probably not suffice. Um, what I also care about is uh, kernel inner RDs. I want as atomic single file updates, right? Like uh, um, these things need to be um, invoked by the bootloader, loaded into memory by the bootloader. And it, it really is an interesting property if we can stick all these things into single files and update them as a single file because that's as close as we get to atomic behavior, meaning that we can update a system and um, because usually the file systems that the bootloaders read are bad, like VFAT, for example. Um, you want to not stress the file system too much and uh, make too many updates that are all required to compete before you can actually boot safely. So uh, I can. I want atomic fi uh, single file updates, right? So basically, you drop one new file in there. Once you dropped it in there, you rename it to the final name, and that's it. That's the end of the story. That's your update of the kernel in RD and so on. Um, yeah, those are my goals, and this is how I intend to do this. Um, 
let's pre-build basic entities on OS vendors build system. I mean, so far that I guess is uh, obvious. Let's include them in a so-called unified kernel image or UKI. Um, and uh, right, you put, put these components together and you sign them um, on the uh, vendor systems all together as one. Uh, then let's add an extension concept because after all we wanted a certain level of modularity um, where we can uh, uh, yeah, add weird networking, weird storage, all the stuff that people want um, without actually having to support that all in the basic inner ID. Um, so yeah, that's this approach to, to deliver some form of modularity, not the same as before, but at least some. Then uh, let's add a concept called credentials um, that allows secure local parameterization of unified kernel images. This is really about, um, yeah, what I mentioned earlier, that we have uh, authenticity checks and uh, confidentiality um, to parameterize the NDRDs in a safe way. Um, let's measure these unified kernel images, um, like the individual components, into a PCR that is otherwise not used. Um, to PCR 11 I picked for that um, because it's, if it's otherwise not used, it starts with zero if we measure our stuff into it. And we can calculate uh, very easily um, uh, what the value is going to be after the kernel has booted. Um, then let's also include a signed TPM2 policy for that PCR 11 in this unified kernel image, right? So you have now one single file that uh, um, is protected as a whole through a secure boot signature. It contains everything that you actually want, um, and when you boot it up, it will see uh, have you will see PCR eleven values on the TPM, um, and it will already have told you the ones that you will see, and you have a signature for them, and you can actually verify them. So uh, yeah, there's going to be the next talk is going to be done by Zbigniew. It's going to be about building this uh, uh, basic NRD because that's an interesting question, like how to actually do this. And I already mentioned that the old ones had these generators and it's all terrible. So this one's going to be much better. But uh, yeah, wait for the next talk by speaking of. Um, let's go into a little bit more detail what unified kernel images are. So um, I already mentioned it's going to be a kernel image and an inner ID. Um, but it's going to be a little bit more. So first of all, um, in the model that I envision, um, it starts with a system V stop EFI stop. This is a little bit of a UFI program that runs in UFI mode. Um, and that is uh, basically what uh, an earlier stage bootloader invokes. And then uh, in, uh, glued to this uh, stub, you'll find the ELF kernel image. ELF kernel image is a bit of a, yeah, it might be misleading because it's also a PE image. It's kind of both. But anyway, this is the real kernel image that we're about to invoke. The basic inner D that we built the way how Spignia uh, wants to build them. Um, one uh, fixed kernel command line is also baked into this. Um, an etcos release file. This is only for like earlier bootloaders to figure out what they're actually booting there. The idea is basically that the etcos release file of the distribution this belongs to. Um, sdboot, like the bootloader from the systemd project, actually uses that to populate the, the menu to show you something useful that this is a Fedora kernel that you're booting. Um, optionally, you can put some more stuff into it, like a boot splash, um, which is shown. Uh, like it's put on, on on screen before we transition into the kernel, right? Still in UFI mode, which is the good thing is that it's really, really early. You can put a device tree um, uh, thing into it if you like. It's not my area of expertise, so I'm just going to quickly mention that. Um, and then this, I briefly mentioned this already, that we uh, can put a signed TPM2 policy um, uh, into this of the PCR values that we expect once the kernel is booted. By the way, I know that I'm very quickly going over all the TPM stuff, and I guess not everybody here knows the TPM stuff so well, but I, yeah, I'm, it's just one facet of the TPM that I care about, which is about the measurements. And uh, If you want to know the details, I hope uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's, it's not that hard. And then <laughs> have another look at that stuff. It's probably the easiest part about all the TPM complexity. Um, anyway, so uh, there's another uh, component inside of these unified kernel images are these PCR uh, signatures. Um, yeah. All that we combine in one single PE file. PE is uh, the Windows executable file that UFI also uses um, with a simple object copy invocation. Object copy is just part of bin utils. It's, it's a way how you can add stuff to binaries, right? Like, so uh, you basically take the stub, you add these things to the end um, so that uh, you now have a big, big file that contains everything you need. Some early UFI boot code, the real kernel, the inner ID, and so on and so on. 
um, once you have the single file, you go and sign it with second boot, like uh, EPE sign, SB sign, whatever tool of choice you want to do that. Now you have something that can be executed directly by the UFI firmware. Um, I mean, it's a PE binary like any other. And eventually, we'll come up with a kernel. Um, this can automatically be enumerated. Already mentioned that because the OS information is is, is uh, inside of that PE image, so it's a PE image, so it's very self-descriptive, right? Like simply be, by looking at that one file, you know exactly what you're actually looking at. Um, yeah. For the details on the system UFI step, I already mentioned that it's a small piece of code that still runs in UFI mode, not in Linux mode, but in, in UFI mode. It uh, what it mostly does it. It, it sees that it has been loaded, it's a PE executable, um, and then just iterates through all the PE sections, like sections or parts of a binary, and uh, tries to find these components. Once it found them, it uh, yeah ultimately invokes the kernel and the inner ID with the kernel command line. That's kind of the key thing what it does. But before that, it can do other things, like trivial things like display a boot splash on screen, uh, load the device tree thing. But the most interesting thing I, uh, um, is, uh, from my perspective at least, is that it ma measures the container, contain kernel and uh, inner ID into PCR R11. I mentioned this, this earlier. Um, PCR R11 is otherwise unused. So uh, by doing this, um, we have pre-measured basically what we're going to start. And then once it's started, we can look at the PCR and know exactly what's going to be in there. Um, something else that it does, it picks up credentials files from the ESP. Right? Like I mentioned this earlier, that I wanted to have secure parameterization. My, uh, um, like the, the, the way how I, how I think this should be implemented is by, by these credential files. Credential files are basically small snippets of data, or I, they don't really have to be that small. I mean, they can be certificates and stuff. They can be anything binary, anything text. Um, and they can be um, encrypted and bound to the local uh, TPM. Uh, it's authenticated um, encryption um, with a symmetric key. And then you can put them, for example, in the ESP. That's one purpose. Uh, one place where you can put them, like in the EFI system partition. And the system D step, when it still runs in UFI mode, it uses the regular file system APIs of UFI, looks for these, um, like just by looking in the same directory that it has been invoked from, um, looks for all these files that end in, in the suffix .cred, picks them up, and then, um, I mean, we'll talk about this later. Maybe I should mention this already. Um, but it basically passes it to the kernel. How it does that, we'll talk about later. Um, it does something similar for init RD extensions. This is about the modularity stuff that I mentioned earlier, right? Like uh, that we still want to be able to run uh, uh, not just with the basic init RD, but uh, want to have extensions for them. So these can also be put in the ESP next to the kernel. I mentioned automatically picked up and passed to the kernel. Um, then uh, what it also does is take this PE PCR signature from one of the sections and pass it to the kernel. Um, how it does that, we'll see later. Yeah. Uh, so this is what what the stub does. Now let's look at the extension image, right? Like the extension images are supposed to be like you have the basic energy and you have a couple of extension images that add additional stuff like weird storage, weird networking, um, or, or what else you want. Um, the the idea again is that the basic energy includes in, in the, that is inside the unit unified kernel image is um, uh, uh, pre-built by the vendor and hence not ex uh, extensible itself, right? You cannot locally insert stuff into that. So uh, um, we added a concept to systemd um, a year ago, something that's called systemd sysx. It's a tiny tool, actually, um, that implements a system extension concept. Like, the primarily, we wanted to have that actually for the host file system, but we can also do that for the inner file system. What it actually does, it just overlays a, uh, a cryptographically secure disk image onto uh, slash user. Overlay means overlay FS. Um, so the idea basically is you have the basic energy, and then you have these images, which are basically GPT disk images with verity and uh, signature and things like that. These are by this tool, system sysx um, mounted, and then overlayfs inserted into slash user where they can add additional files. I mean, the, the concept is that they're supposed to be additive, right? They're not supposed to replay stuff. You can do that with overlayfs too, and we will not block you from doing this, but conceptually, um, we want them to be additive, right? Like, so you have the base OS, and then you add on top the LVM files that you need through one of these extensions. You can use it any way you want, of course, but this is how I, I personally, in particular, intend this to be used. Uh, yeah, I mentioned this, uh, it works on host OS and in the nerdy. Um, 
And these system extension images are GPT disk images. Um, they implement a specification uh, that we put together in system view context, this Carol partition specification. It's basically, the specification just lists a couple of GPT partition type UIDs that have specific meanings. Um, Typically, they would contain three partitions. One is uh, the actual user file system to overlay onto the init ID. Could be SquashFS, but we don't care. Um, a DM Verity data partition for this, and a, uh, another partition that just contains the PKCR7 signature um, of the root hash of the DM Verity. Um, when one of these images is activated, um, we just set up a loopback device, um, tell D, uh, DM Crypt, uh, DM Verity uh, that there's yeah, Verity set up, pass along the PKCS7 signature, and then the rest happens inside of the kernel. Um, uh, and then there it's even measured and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's, it's not even we in user space who verify this. It's all done actually by the kernel itself. So it actually integrates with IMA and IPE and all these kernel level um, security frameworks that care for information like this. Um, yeah, mentioned this already. Uh, it's all merged into slash user via overlay FS, read, read only, purely additive. Um, but this is not enforced. Um, yeah, the, the, this is not supposed to be package manager, right? Like package managers are tr traditionally relatively fine-grained. They're not as fine-grained as the init RD generators probably would like them to be, but uh, um, they are still, yeah, not even supposed to be as fine-grained as package man manager. So they are not supposed to be one of these extension images for each library or something. If you do that, I mean, you can do that if you like to, but I would strongly advise you not to. Um, the idea is really that these add whole subsystem, right? Like that you have the basic one and then you have one for LVM maybe and one for iSCSI boot and so on and so on. Um, how this is actually implemented by the distributions, of course, entirely up to the distributions if they actually buy into this model. Um, version handling, because there's a question um, why we can't do this right away. <clears throat> Uh, hello, uh, I have a question. So these extension modules are signed also by the vendor or? Yeah. Okay. So the idea basically is that these uh, extension images are built at the same time uh, uh, as the init RD uh, as are, as themselves are built at the same time as the kernel is built and they just are not installed by default except if you actually want it. So it's it's not supposed to be a package manager again, right? Like, And there, because of that, there's also really no version handling. Right? Like there is no, I need this specific kernel version at least and this one at most or something like this. We don't want dependency health uh, stuff and not replicated package manager. So all it does basically, there's a system extension API level and then you say, okay, this is for kernel number 77, API 77 and then, or init RD uh, 77 and then that's it. And it, how you upgrade that level is entirely for you, but it's supposed to be linear and simple, but Again, this is for the distributions to figure out how to, they actually want to use this. This is just how I say how this should go. So how are these extension images picked up by um, the kernel when booted? I mentioned this already that the system stop is supposed to um, search for these files in the ESP directory where the image itself is in. Um, it loads them then into memory and generates on the fly CPIO um, in it already image from them because I'm um, not everybody knows this but the kernel actually is happy to accept as many CPIO archives um, as uh, you want you can just concatenate them um, and uh, CPIOs are an extremely simple uh, format I mean there's a reason why the kernel picked that format uh, for the inner IDs. so we can actually trivially um, uh, easily generate them also from that systemd stuff UFI stuff um, so this is what it does, and it puts them in one fixed directory in uh, uh, slash dot extra dot sysx. Um, it basically, yeah, this makes sure that we can use the ESP um, UFI firmware drivers to still load them, and then in the NRD they're just that. So I have a question. Uh, the dot extra directory, as I understood correctly, it lives on rootfs, right? We're talking about the init RD, right? Like, so the init RD is run in a temp FS ultimately these days, even though we. Okay, so uh, uh, dot extra FS uh, uh, directory it lives in the init RD image, let's say. Sorry? So if you put. Uh, yes. So, so, oh, sorry about that. Uh, so, the question is where the dot extra directory lives in init RD or. Uh, or in rootfs file system? No, I mean, they're supposed to contain information about how to find the root file system. So if we would put them there, that would be defeating the point. We so they are, 
They are copied. Maybe I misunderstood. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. They are just one CPIO in it or D. Okay, okay. Any other. And then they are all unpacked one after the other by the kernel. So oh, okay. they are just in the temp FS that is, that is the. Oh, okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Got, got it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, system so, Sysx then uh, looks into that directory and picks them out automatically, uh, goes to the kernel, sets them up, kernel verifies everything, all is good, measures them, uh, and so on. Um, and there you go. Now we have a, a, quick. a slash user file system that has both the basic stuff in and this extension. Quick question Is the last point actually true? No. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's, if, if uh, because like system exists, exists and it does things, what it does. But it looks right in now, varlib. It doesn't look into that yeah, place. It I, apparently, I, actually doesn't look into that directory. Yes. The reason why it doesn't do look into this directory right now is uh, that it's like we cannot trust the stuff that is in that directory because it comes directly uh, through the EST. Right? We must establish trust first, um, and uh, sysx right now um, trusts everything it sees. Right. So uh, what's still missing in sysx is that uh, when we read the image from that directory, we must insist that it uh, uh, is uh, Verity enabled, right? And that part is still missing. It's a tiny bit of policy check extra. Uh, but yeah, good point. Uh, I mean, most of this exists. Let's say 93%, uh, um, but there are still uh, gaps. Uh, let's talk a little bit about parameter. There's a question. So it's still a question on previous one re extensions. So how how do you measure re extensions? So you you must measure them as well. Uh, so we don't. Uh, we leave that to the kernel really right now. Um, like there's I I M A, but uh, I'm not sure. Like I I don't have a like a practical experience with that because I I, I never actually used I M A myself. I just know that people do. Um, but uh, uh, SysX from, from, from user space will sort the images and execute them in alphabetical order to make the measurements stable. But right now, the assumption is that the kernel does that and we don't. I mean, you couldn't extend the system D stub to enumerate and measure PCRs into so, I mean, PCRs of all okay, of those files so, if you really wanted okay, to. Okay, uh, this was the incomplete answer. I, I, I would expect that IMA will eventually measure this. But also, systemd stub measures them also into uh, another PCR. So uh, systemd stub actually not only deals with PCR 11, it also has P PCR 13 or something that is otherwise not used, where it measures um, uh, uh, system extensions into, and then there's another PCR where it um, measures parameters like kernel command line and the credentials too. So you have your choice basically from three PCRs, like one is the kernel itself, one is the system extension images, and one is everything that is parameters. Um, and it's up to you how you bind your policy together. But again, I still think, um, like, I mean, it, it depends what, what do you actually want to measure. Do you want to measure all the stuff that was passed over, or do you want to measure the stuff that it was used? Um, I have the suspicion, in many cases, that's the latter thing, right? But I mean, how distributions end up implementing this is up to them. Um, uh, uh, by default, the uh, uh, like disk encryption policies are something that bind to TPM that we also ship in systemd that don't care about uh, uh, either of them, like it only cares about the kernel stuff. That's why. Things like common line and, and changes to an ERD, we can be sensitive from security point of view. So that's why it's actually important to measure everything. Yeah, yeah, we so, we do measure yeah, everything. Yeah, like, and that's, actually, that's enough, and then everyone can. Do if you look like, in the man page um, uh, that we have about this, it actually measures like because different parts of the system measure different things to different PCRs. There's a massive overlap. So there are actually some resources that are measured four times into four different PCRs, uh, in effect. Um, so uh, they, I put a table there, actually, because it's very confusing, the fact that uh, everything is measured so many times. Um, and it basically tells you for every resource uh, uh, what you can pick there. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, we now have uh, individual PCRs for the relevant stuff that I personally would at least uh, bind stuff that you can, uh, to that you can pre-calculate. I think you might have already answered this, but is are you, are you taking into account? I mean, because that's a lot of PCRs. Are you taking into account like how to actually upgrade individual components without changing too many, um, just because of you know? So uh, um, it's a good question, actually. Um, maybe I have a slide about this, but uh, I already mentioned this. It's like the model that I'm 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 I'm, I'm uh, following here is not so much that PCRs. Uh, uh, are what policy is bound to, but that signatures of PCRs is what policy is bound to. 
right? So uh, um, the TPM uh, uh, actually is happy to verify for you that the TPMs are in a specific t a state if you give a signature along uh, with it and the public key that belongs to that signature was enrolled when the disk encryption was done. So this is a different model. So how most of the distributions who ever did TPM stuff implement this because it basically means uh, when you update your OS, you don't have to re-enroll, right? Like, um, because it's up to you now um, to, like the vendor can simply, because everything's pre-calculatable, it can pre-calculate what the PCR value is gonna be and then the result it can sign and put in the UKI. I mentioned this earlier in the slides that there's a section to put the signatures in. Um, and this is what, what is then used uh, and basically relieves us from having to re-enroll and everything because the idea of re-enrolling on system updates um, uh, because all the TPMs changed every time again and again, that might work if you only care about root file system and nothing else. But uh, I think uh, 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 there's more in this world than root file systems. We want to encrypt credentials, for example, which are just files somewhere in the file system um, and bind them to the TPM. And we cannot possibly, just because we update the kernel, go through all possible files in this world that were ever encrypted like this and re-encrypt re them basically with a new key. So um, one of the key models here really is, of the key design points is, we don't um, bind policy to hash values, we hide them to signature hashes for the PCR stuff. The PCRs are just measuring the hash plus signature, or, or what? What, what, what is actually so the PCR, going on? Like, uh, the PCRs are measured, like the measuring process works the same as always. However, the, if you then have a, a secret key, you want to lock against them. You don't lock against the literal values, but against the um, the signatures of values. It's like you know SecuPoint, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, SecuPoint, yeah, you can enroll sure hashes. You can enroll yeah. signatures, right? We do the exact same thing for PCR. It's uh, like it's the way how I think TPMs are should be used, but uh, it's not how most people like most implementations so far do. I mean, I know that some people do, and probably behind closed doors, people do, but um, yeah. On the chat, someone's asking, where is the kernel getting the credentials to verify the Verity signatures? Uh, um, the Verity signatures, like, I mean, uh, uh, the credentials to verify the kernel. Like, uh, the, the public key is baked into the kernel itself. That's, exactly, that's the idea that, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, kernel modules need to verify, uh, system exchanges need to verify, um, you need to verify lots of things. The idea is that you always bind it back to the kernel as much as you can. And because the kernel is secular would verify it, um, this is your hook, how you then uh, uh, um, yeah, put everything else on. Um, uh, okay, so I still have some slides. By the way, we don't have to go through all the slides. I think like the basic concepts I already explained, but uh, um, I'm actually really happy if there's a discussion going on. Um, I pr much prefer that of just going through my slides. But anyway, if nobody has a question right now, let's continue with the parameterization. So uh, in a secular environment, passing parameters to the kernel is uh, problematic if done without uh, uh, authentication, right? Like, because for example, if you have a kernel command line option and you use it to turn off uh, some security feature, as Linux equals zero, then you have compromised the system in a drastic way. So uh, um, yeah, uh, in circuit boot environments, at least the way I see them, kernel command line is locked down. Um, it's uh, in the model I mentioned earlier that it's included in the unified kernel image and you can't change it um, without uh, uh, making system unbootable. Um, now, uh, uh, <clears throat> so what do we do instead, right? Sometimes we need to pass information after all, um, uh, iSCSI information, networking stuff, whatever else. So how do we do this? Um, uh, in system we have this credentials uh, concept as I said, but it's very hard to uh, authenticate and do, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's uh, nasty to authenticate and um, decrypt them already in UFI. So, uh, um, because that basically means if you do something complex as that, you basically have to include a TPM stack and uh, open SSL pretty much um, in the UFI code. I mean, uh, shim embeds open SSL, but I'm not sure if that's something we should repeat. So we'd rather avoid that. So we came up with the concept of credentials. The idea is really that um, credentials are, are authenticated and decrypted the moment they're used, not the moment where we pass them somewhere. Um, credentials are uh, uh, something that uh, we added to system. The originally they are service credentials. So it's, uh, it's a way how you can pass parameters to system services. But uh, we all extended the model to also have something like system credentials that you pass into a system. 
Originally, the systems you could pass them to were basically containers, um, like system the endpoint containers specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, we made this possible that you can also pass them into uh, anything else. Like for example, you nowadays can pass them in from a VM manager through something like SM BIOS Type 11. Not going to go too much detail there. But uh, yeah, so there are various ways how you can pass these bits of information that are potentially uh, authenticated and encrypted um, into the system. Here we added a, a new one so that you can actually source them from the ESP. Um, the data that's included in service credentials is really up to you. It can be anything really. The, my assumed use for it is identity information, server information, certificates, key material, passwords, and some things like that. Um, yeah, when you pass them to the system, they're system credentials. Credentials can be encrypted and authenticated. We use AES uh, 256 GCM. Um, uh, by default, they are encrypted uh, symmetrically and, and authenticated symmetrically by a key that is the combination of something that is locked to the TPM and in the local file system. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, we I talked earlier about how uh, the EFI stub stuff um, picks up the system extensions, exact same way it picks up the credentials and puts them in a CPIO. Um, they can then, once the system is booted, they're just there, and you can propagate them down to services. Um, uh, many systems components support them, but we keep adding uh, uh, places where you can add them. Because for us, they are more than just uh, something we can use in the context here of, uh, of booting and parameterizing uh, a physical boot. But we can also use them to, uh, as a cl cloud in its replacement in a way uh, to provision information into virtual machines and things like that. Uh, from by the way, like how does the API look like from receiving side? Um, yeah, if you have a service, you just get an environment variable called dollar credentials directory and you read them their files that's that easy. The service receives them unencrypted, right? And uh, if namespacing allows it, uh, um, the only they will see them and nobody else on the system. Uh, all this happens in user space. Anyway, um, I don't only have less than uh, five minutes uh, left, the uh, time left, so I'd rather switch to using that for question than for the rest of the slides. Um. The first question, I think this is quite an interesting idea. Uh, sorry, uh, but uh, I have a question. Do you see any problems with impl implementing this uh, approach in other bootloaders uh, than uh, systemd uh, boot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, is anything which is anything in this implementation which relies on system D boot no. Uh, specific? No. So, so everything that I was talking about is SD stuff. So system D has SD boot and system D has SD stuff. The the boot is just a boot menu. It's not even actually okay. a loader. And uh, all the stuff about the credential stuff is uh, uh, and the system extension pickup and the PCR stuff that is implemented in the system D stuff thing, which is its little ah. glue program that you glue in front of it. But any bootloader can invoke that, right? Okay. Like it could be um, grub or whatever else. Um, however, um, it expects a relatively complete UFI environment to be useful, right? Like, for example, um, the, if it shall pick up the system extensions and the credentials, it needs file system API on the image that it's loaded from, right? I think this is what, for example, Grub currently doesn't do that, right? Like it, it gives you a file handle that isn't actually, there's no file system behind it, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I understand that you are saying that if we call the, the system D, uh, system uh, stop from the Grub uh, directly, it will work. Okay, this, yeah. is, this is obvious. But if you want to implement the functionality of system D uh, stop, uh, in the grab, it is possible. Doesn't uh, this functionality rely on anything, anything specific? Okay. I mean, a system is stuff is a trivial piece of code. Like, I mean, it does not number of things, yeah. right? It measures stuff. Um, it looks but... like an API. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand it, it that, but... Like, it uses the, the TPM APIs, it generates CPIOs, it does. Uh... That's nothing. Okay, fancy. okay, okay. Just asking. It's okay, thanks a lot. Piece of code. Uh, I mean, in Ubuntu, we do boot system D stuff with grub. With just exact space, blah blah blah. Uh, but we are all loading EFI stuff by so we are loading EFI stuff binary from the from the from the graph using chain loader, right? Uh, or... Chain loader or okay, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, sorry, just one quickly. Um, you mentioned that the command line is is signed and you can't change it, but then you. I, I had the impression that you were about to say how there is a way you can modify it, but I don't see that here. It's just not possible at all. Well, 
So, I mean, this is a, an issue that comes up all, all, um, like uh, this entire ideas have been circulating for a while, right? Like, and this is an issue that it comes up all the time because people love changing the uh, kernel command line. So, um, I personally do not do that very much, right? Like, I, it's, um, I, I know that people do this. I know that people do this, but uh, um, I think uh, if you change your kernel command line, you're a hacker, right? You're not a regular user. And that's if you then turn off secure boot to allow this, then that I think is fine. That said, people have been asking for this all the time, and this recently came up in confidential computing context, where people asked, um, they don't actually care that they want to be change the kernel command line freely, they just want to be have the ability to choose from a couple of okay um, choices, right? Like, for example, they want one that indicates debug boot and another one that's a factory reset boot and things like that. So uh, uh, we discussed this as an RFE in systemd, and everybody agrees how to do this, that we just going to allow that you can embed in a couple of other more PE sections that just encode, oh, by the way, this is also a good configuration where you pass it, like where you define a fixed command line, give it a name, um, like an identifier and, and a pretty name. And then um, SD boot, for example, looks at this PE, PE section and looks at all of them. And then it defines like seven different configurations are supported and generates seven uh, boot menu items from them. And uh, that's how you support it. But uh, I know that people want to total flexibility, but I mean, you have to make compromises in life, right? Like you can't um, give people the uh, ability to turn off all the security features because that's what the kernel command line does if you want to enforce security, like, yeah, I mean, I, I was supposed to just give the example of uh, the debug mode in system D, whatever, which is in the command line. But if, if it's one of those things where you can pick from yeah. a certain set, then for most users, that's probably enough. That's the exactly, idea. right. Like, And then the distributions would have the freedom to pick as many different sets that they want to support. Um, and then, yeah. Anyway, this. Yeah, so a uh, question regarding the um, the extended modules that you were talking about. So the flexibility here will be uh, laying for the vendor. So the vendor will choose what do they think the user will need and they will create this extension. Yeah. They, you won't give the ability to the users to be able to load their own. Well, um, you can do whatever you want with this, right? Like, is this just like the model that I have in my head? I'm, I'm not even a distribution vendor personally. Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, it's do it, use it the way you want. Um, uh, uh, we, we, this is all new stuff that is not widely deployed. Some of it are more widely deployed than others, um, but uh, uh, you know, I'm to make this very clear. I don't intend this to be another package manager, right? This is this is the. I, I, it's good to know what you are, and it's also good to know what you really don't want to be. And I don't want to be in the business of being RPM. Um, so uh, that's why I underlined this. But then again, it's free software. <laughs> you suit forever, you, whatever you want. And if you want to come up with a model where, where third party people can generate these images, knock yourself out. I have no problem with that. Just as it comes to, to the point of um, security and verification, in this case, if I'm allowing users to do that, like, uh, for example, the third party kernel modules, like X drivers for specific vendor, won't be signed because it's not it was in the kernel. So the user, the only way is either to sign their own images from everything for kernel graphs and everything, or just the